Welcome to Dr. Paola Uccelli's presentation, Affirming and Amplifying Student Voices Towards Equity and Excellence in Literacy Learning at School. I'm going to be introducing the session and facilitating the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. My name is Dr. Ricky Price Baugh. I am the Director of Academic Achievement with the Council of Great City Schools which is an organization of 77 large urban districts, 27 of which volunteer to participate in the TUDA program of NAEP testing. Council staff have also taken part in the visioning panels for the development of NAEP frameworks in both mathematics and reading. And we are proud to be co-sponsoring this reading summit. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Paola Uccelli, Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. You may have read her biography in the agenda, outlining the focus of her research, which has been funded by IES, as well as other organizations. NAEP data and the pandemic has underscored the need for educators to have a deeper understanding of how to approach core academic language skills while leveraging students' identities and experiences around worthwhile texts and tasks. Dr. Uccelli's work is grounded through her partnerships with schools, predominantly in the USA and in Latin America. Among her many research projects, Dr. Uccelli has worked on the design and evaluation of the kinds of interventions that both affirm and amplify students' voices. She studies sociocultural and individual differences in both multilingual and monolingual students' language development throughout their school years. And she strives to integrate the perspective of language learning as the acquisition of skills and language learning as participating in sociocultural practices. Dr. Uccelli has also focused on the collaborative design of educational methods that expand students' language resources using multidisciplinary, culturally affirming, and arts-based approaches. Her papers have been published in numerous academic journals. As you know, her session today has already been recorded, but we will join you live at the conclusion of her presentation for the Q&A session. We'll take questions from the chat space, so as questions arise, please feel free to put them in the chat. So now, let's begin Dr. Uccelli's presentation. Hello, and thank you for your interest in this presentation on language and reading. What I will present is work that I've conducted with many colleagues and students, as you can see on this slide, and work that has been funded mostly by the Institute of Education Sciences, but also by some other funders. And what I will argue based on about 15 years of research is that without understanding and addressing the immense variability in language skills that kids bring to school, schools run the risk of maintaining or even exacerbating the inequalities of the larger society. Now, let me clarify that I don't intend to imply that language needs to be the end goal of instruction. To the contrary, all we know points to the fact that language needs to be embedded, subordinated to learning goals that are focused on conceptual understanding and meaning making, but through practices that are attentive to the language strengths and needs of students and to the linguistic demands of school tasks. So we're going to focus on language skills in this presentation, but before we do that, I want us to reflect on the fact that language can be at school either a gateway or a gatekeeper to students. In other words, each language interaction at school can expand students' learning or obstruct their learning. It can affirm, validate, welcome their voices, 
or it can silence them. And so even though we focus on language skills, we need to keep in mind that skills are used and learned in particular cultural contexts linked with identities. As Lisa Delpit puts it, language is the skin that we speak, connected with emotions, with identities, with a culture. And school is a particular cultural context with particular cultural ways of using language. It's only by affirming, validating, welcoming a student's own language resources and voices that we can expand learning. And from language development, we know that it is actually when kids express themselves, when they are listened to carefully, and when they are um, scaffolded to sharpen their own meanings that actually language and learning advances. So we're going to focus mostly on language skills, but we'll come back to this perspective at the very end of this presentation. And what I'll do in the next uh, slides is think about what is challenging for schools and students for uh, adolescent literacy, introduce this construct that we have researched in our work, core analytical language skills, and then think about instructional implications. So today's educational systems are serving more linguistically diverse and socioeconomically diverse populations than perhaps ever before. This is due to national and international migration and also to the expansion of school enrollment in the global south. And at the same time, schools are pressed to equip students with high, um, higher literacy skills than ever before, so they can navigate the opportunities in education, in professional, uh, and professional opportunities and careers, and even navigate the spaces of health, politics, civic engagement, and even social news. In this information-based society where almost everything is mediated by text. So language and learning are at the core of the educational enterprise in these moments in time in particular. And so the motivation of my work is to try to generate evidence from students' language development and from samples that are similar and representative of the um, populations that public schools serve so that uh, we can learn um, from them to better understand how to support literacy and learning overall. So what I will share with you uh, today, and this is sort of an abstract of what's to come, is that we found striking individual differences from grades four through grade eight in this construct of language that I will explain uh, shortly, CALS or core analytical language skills. And that these CALS actually predict reading comprehension above basic skills, vocabulary, and sociodemographic characteristics. We have data from about 7,000 students in English, and we have consistent results in Spanish and in Portuguese with this work. And we have also a small sample with dual language learners in Spanish and English that I will share. So we believe, based on this evidence, that CALS is promising to design literacy instruction for both equity and excellence. But let's start with this um, meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is sort of a study of studies. And in this meta-analysis, the authors studied discussion-based approaches that, were, um, that sought to improve reading comprehension. And what they found was that no wonder that increased student talk, but also these uh, approaches tended to result in improvements in text comprehension. And there were a variety of approaches, as you can see there. But yet, when we look at classroom discussion in, you know, in regular classrooms, eh, we don't find a lot of discussion going on. So in this study, which is, you know, granted a little eh, old, but this is the evidence that we have, is you know, the, the authors went to visit middle and high school and observed classrooms in English language arts and social studies, and they measured how many minutes of discussion was present per 60 minutes of um, 
instruction in these two areas. And discussion they defined as a conversation among three or more people that lasted 30 seconds or more. And so, or more than 30 seconds. And so they observed these classrooms that unfortunately were divided in, in many schools into low academic, middle, high academic tracks, some mixed classes. And they estimated the minutes of discussion per 60 minutes of instruction. So just take a guess. What do you think? How many minutes were did they find on average and whether it was similar or different across the different tracks? And I'll show you the results in a second. So what they found is actually in the context in which most classroom discussion was found, it was only about three minutes and a half. So classroom discussion was overall very infrequent. But also, if you look across the tracks, what you see is the kids who presumably need most of these uh, opportunities to learn, those kids in low academic track classes were actually afforded the fewest amount of, the, the lowest amount of time in classroom a discussion. So this is a picture that shows not only infrequency in classroom discussion, but also an inequitable distribution of those opportunities to learn across these um, track classes. And why is discussion important? Well, because we know that in becoming proficient readers, language comprehension is a more challenging area than decoding. And so what we have seen in prior research is that many bilingual English learners display age appropriate word recognition skills, but they actually cannot understand the texts that they can read aloud. So don't get me wrong, there are plenty of kids who need support with word recognition and fluency, and that is an absolutely important goal. But there are plenty of kids who have mastered those skills that continue to, to struggle with reading comprehension. So even for kids who need support with word recognition skills, supporting and scaffolding language will be absolutely crucial. But yet, you know, these are bilingual uh, speakers reading in a second or an additional language, perhaps not that surprising. But research shows this pattern also for many monolingual English-only uh, kids. So what to do in schools about this situation? Well, we've seen interventions focused on word recognition skills and fluency, interventions that foster reading comprehension strategies, vocabulary interventions, and all of those have um, made some improvement and have shown to be important areas for instruction, but yet they uh, have proven insufficient to move the needle to improve adolescent literacy. So in my work, I hypothesized that there might be other school relevant language resources beyond vocabulary that are important in reading comprehension and yet not identified and not attended to. But which skills are those? And so this is where my work has focused on this construct of core analytical language skills. And why is language such a challenge, right? After all, don't we learn language early on in life and then just add words to our repertoire? Well, actually, what we know from a research is that language learning continues throughout a adolescence, potentially throughout life, because if we think about language use, the way language development uh, can be understood is as expanding language resources to navigate an increasing variety of contexts. So we move from family to friends, to academic communities, to work communities. And what happens is that the resources that we use in one context certainly overlap with those of other contexts, but in some way there are systematic, unpredictable 
uh, differences. And so we truly learn ways of using language in particular contexts, not only sort of English as a whole. And the other interesting piece is that learners or language users can be skilled at using language in some contexts and not in others. So we know that many kids who look skilled and fluent and sophisticated in irony and in narratives and in jokes in the cafeteria or in recess might actually find the language of texts um, impenetrable. It feels almost like a foreign language. And it's not as distinct as for us, many of us academics, when we hear adolescents talking to each other, that might also feel completely as a foreign language. And so what being interested in education, what I'm interested in is, of course, the social context of school. And so, you know, following on this idea, what happens is as students bring their everyday knowledge to school and they have to learn scientific uh, knowledge, they also bring their more conversational language to school and they encounter uh, the language of text, which is much more dense in information and has many resources that they use infrequently or never with their friends. And so this is where we propose the construct core analytical language skills, which is high utility language resources, characteristics of the um, language of texts in school. And what we hypothesize is first that we would find individual differences in the language resources that are used in these texts of school, right? In the sort of scientific textbooks of social studies, of science, and that these differences in mastery of these language resources would predict, would help explain difficulties with reading comprehension. But just to make it a little bit more concrete, we can look at this uh, text and I'll show you the specific features we've identified as challenging for adolescent readers. So if we look at this text, what would you think are challenging language features for kids? First of all, academic vocabulary, I'm sure that jumped to you immediately, but we talked to many teachers who told us, I've taught all the vocabulary words in this text and my kids still do not understand the language of text. So we look for additional uh, challenging resources. Connectives like moreover, consequently, nevertheless, also seem to be challenging for kids, as are complex words and complex sentences that are often characteristics of school, characteristic of school texts. And another area that we found challenging for kids is sort of the markers of a writer's viewpoint or epistemic stance markers when the writer is telling us, you know, how true this assertion is. Is it extremely likely? Is it extremely unlikely? Is it possible? Uh, it might be true that those are also markers that kids find uh, challenging. And finally, school texts often <clears throat> use what is called conceptual anaphora, anaphora or this tracking of ideas in a complex way that, you know, when you see this problem here in this text, it's actually referring to a very complex idea that was articulated before. And so kids need to do that matching and keep that idea in mind to continue with the flow of ideas. So these are the resources that we found as high utility language resources used in text across content areas. If you open any informational text, any uh, explanatory text in school, in biology, in social studies, it's very likely that you will find many of these features, if not all of them, in the text. And so this is basically the construct, the core analytical language skills construct and the six domains that are encompassed by this construct. And this is an example of an item of an instrument. So the items are very simple and it's a very simple test, but there's a lot of thinking behind it. And let me just share that I never thought I would uh, design an assessment. I like to analyze 
a kids language discourse and a, never thought I would construct an assessment. But when we were partnering with schools in this a research project, a, the schools told us if you want to a, study that you can come and evaluate kids for 45 minutes. And so that's what a, led me to the design of an assessment. But I've been so skeptical, we've tried each and every item very, very carefully and talk to so many kids and, and teachers. And so in this item, we're measuring the understanding of in contrast. And what I will show you here is the percent of kids in each grade from grade four through grade eight that got this item correct, that understood in contrast. And I will show it to you in the next slide. So what we have found is that not even half of eighth graders understood in contrast in a very simple context. It's more interesting even because they think they know this connective. They've heard it for many years, but they truly have not had the opportunities to um, understand and learn the uh, function that it serves. And so what we find actually is enormous individual variability in this construct that we call a CAL. So these are real classrooms at different grades. And this bar, each bar is an individual kit and it's a representation of their CAL score. So their proficiency in all these language resources that we call CALs. And what you see here is enormous individual variability. So you can imagine this as being kids sitting elbow to elbow in a classroom and teachers need to address or to um, at least be conscious of that uh, variability. So these are graphs we've used with teachers and they have found them helpful in understanding the variability in their classrooms. But the question we had was whether these individual differences would actually help explain variability in reading comprehension. And so this is what we uh, found. We have found actually that CALs predict reading comprehension, even when we take into account vocabulary knowledge, a fluency and sociodemographic characteristics. And so this is where we see this construct as promising to inform instruction. And just to give you a little bit of, you know, how that works with dual language learners, if you look at Spanish, the core expectations and the language resources that scientific discourse uses are very similar. So we designed an assessment in Spanish from scratch. We validated it in Chile. We've administered it to thousands of kids in Latin America now. And then we brought it back and we used it to assess dual language learners in Spanish, English, dual language immersion schools. And what we have found is very interesting because we found that Spanish CALS significantly contributes to English uh, reading comprehension, even when English CALS is accounted uh, for. And so the higher the English CALS, the more beneficial impact of Spanish CALS on reading comprehension. So I just wanted to share that little piece of additional research. But in sum, what we find is striking individual differences in CALS that are actually helpful to better understand reading comprehension uh, challenges. But so what are the implications for practice of all this research? Let me just say that all this research was conducted as part of the Catalyzing Comprehension Through Discussion and Debate project, which you know, was led by Susan Donovan and Catherine Snow. And what we did in that project, we hypothesized the structured discussion in the classroom of course, supported by a curriculum uh, that was engaging and with teacher uh, workshops that prepare them for that would actually be predictive of um, reading comprehension. It would support 
that structured discussion supported by these materials would impact students' analytical language, reasoning, and social perspective taking, taking the perspective of others, and that that would improve deep reading uh, comprehension. It is worth mentioning that this research was actually conducted in close collaboration with teachers. It incorporated teachers and students' feedback throughout the intervention while we tested this hypothesis. And just in brief, what we found is in fact that these discussions and debates about texts that are, you know, discussions framed around engaging questions for kids actually improved these three skill sets and in turn improved reading comprehension. And so all these materials that were generated as part of this project are available online. You can just register and access the word generation materials. There's also another intervention that was led by Larry Hemphill, which is for struggling readers that it's called a story. And all of these resources are available on the internet. And so we know that not only we have enormous individual differences that predict reading comprehension, but that these language skills seem malleable, we can improve them and in so doing support reading comprehension, particularly in the context of discussion and debate. And so through talk about texts and ideas, we learn to talk, we learn to read and comprehend, we learn to reason with others and to understand others' perspectives. And yet there's one more point, very important point that I want to make before finishing. Voices are often not equally distributed in schools. In fact, different voices are not always equally welcome at school. And just to give you an example, I'll give you a couple of seconds to read this interaction. So what is happening in this interaction? The teacher clearly is understanding this kid, but in her efforts to support language uh, development and in correcting this student, she's actually silencing this student. Interestingly note that this teacher is the author of this uh, article. We all uh, fall into these interactions and we all need to be reflective about these ways of using language. But I would say that discussion and debate are absolutely crucial mechanisms to support reading comprehension, but that we need to affirm each student's voice. We know from language development that we learn language by using language, by talking and by connecting with others. And so we need to value and welcome home languages and language varieties. And we need to focus first on students' meanings and then on other uh, pieces. And we need, as Hornberger has demonstrated in her work, to grant each student the right to speak so that we can build from their, their additional language resources to expand them. So this continuum of affirming voices and amplifying language at school, I see the teacher as orchestrating multiple voices and moving flexibly from language that is closer to kids to language that is closer to texts, but in a way that builds that scaffolds and that always welcome students out of school language resources. And so let me just end with sort of this informed vision, which is a class informed vision would invite and empower students, not only to abide by the conventions of school discourse, but also to encourage them to creatively depart from them through reflective choices and to use their multilingual and multidialectal language resources to make meaning from text. So students need to be independent and flexible learners of content and language in an interconnected world. 
where not only information is constantly updated, but language also changes dynamically as a result of this mobile and interconnected world and new communicative needs that we have, and of course, new technologies. So let me close just again with this idea of language as gateway or gatekeeper and how to think always to use language as welcoming, as affirming, validating, welcoming voices in order to expand learning. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and interest, and I look forward to discussing these ideas with you. Thank you to all my collaborators, and if you're interested in talking more about these ideas, of course, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Gracias. Well, Dr. Uccelli, thank you so much for sharing these insights with us. I really appreciated your reminding us that decoding and, and vocabulary are important, but they are insufficient to really build the kind of reading comprehension we want for our monolingual and bilingual students. Teachers may need some support in learning how to develop their students' high utility language resources, as you discussed, um, so that they can learn to unlock that, uh, un that academic text. You mentioned that you've been working and collaborating in a number of schools, both here in the United States and in South America. How have teachers and students responded to this approach? of incorporating more discussions and developing students' core analytic language skills? Yeah, thank you, Ricky. Thanks for your introduction and thanks for the, for the question. I think what we are learning in the field very strongly, we used to think that if kids are prepared to be excellent readers by grade three, then it's sort of the inoculation model. They are ready for reading throughout school. And the more we've learned about reading throughout these last 15 years or so, is that kids continue to need support because reading changes as the content changes and the language also gets more complex. So I would say this approach of discussion and debate has been illuminating for teachers. On the one hand, we've worked with teachers who, when they observed their kids talk and discuss controversial issues such as should we legalize drugs or should every student learn a second language in school they have been actually amazed and surprised by the ideas and the complexity of uh, the meanings that kids offer and so i would say giving students a space to, to speak their minds, to speak about issues that are complex and that they care about, is insightful for teachers. So teachers then realize that there's so much more that, that students can bring to the, to the learning instead of being understood as passive observers, uh, right? And I, I think you know, Nick Elmore, who was my colleague at Harvard Ed School, used to say that he had devoted all his life thinking that he had to change teachers' minds to change teachers' practices. And by the end of his career, he had understood you have to change teachers' practices, and that will convince them uh, of changing their beliefs if the practices proved a uh, productive, right? So, so I think it's an interesting perspective to to try little pieces and see how that uh, might change uh, the, the perspective of, of we educators as a whole. I mean, this year has been a huge learning experience for all of us. We all have to try new things and that has expanded uh, our, our way of, of thinking. So it's hard to change what you do always, right? And it's risky. But, but if you try it and you see something that it's exciting and that, that it's engaging and that it's productive for kids, then you have much more a persuasive power, right? To, to incorporate those practices. I think that in an earlier session today, the panel discussion 
uh, one of the panelists from San Antonio mentioned how much the teachers were surprised to hear how well the students did and how much they could comprehend and build in their own command of language. And that that really excited and, and caused them to do even more of that work. So that's kind of what you're saying here as well. And, and Ricky, I think that's a great example because I was in that session and, and uh, San Antonio, a public school district, a, I think it was Olivia and Esmeralda who were sharing their work with us. It was a very interesting way in which they, I don't know the, the program that they were describing, but this integration of fluency with discussion and, and oral scaffolding, right? So there are very... Uh, creative ways in which you can do both. And I would say for adolescents, the study program that, that we tried, which was developed by, by Larry Hemphill, um, is offers a model for adolescents in which uh, the program provide, f provides fluency passages at different levels of decoding difficulty, but on the same topic so that kids practice in partners the fluency passages, but then they all engage in a discussion about a big question. So I think that's the important piece. I don't mean to say that fluency is not important, the word recognition skills is not important, absolutely not, or that vocabulary is not important. We know, you know, the work by Freddie Hibbert and all that interesting sort of knowledge-centered uh, vocabulary, all of that is important, but we also need to engage kids in the discussion of ideas that sort of simulate the way texts are constructed so that they learn all these other structures that are helpful for engaging actively with text. Absolutely. And I know, because I was involved in the San Antonio project, mm -hmm. that uh, one of the things that they were very careful to do was that in selecting the text that they were going to use, they knew that every child, was going to get exposure to that final text, the grade level or above text, so that they had the opportunity to hear that kind of language, but to be scaffolded and ready to work with that text so that they could see what beautiful language sounds like, reads like, and participate with their peers. So it's, it's a really intricate process that they do and has really given them some good results, I think. Um, I was also wondering if uh, the teachers you've been working with, have they developed some materials uh, that they use in their work with students that you think has potential to be shared? Yeah, we are we are in the process of doing that. So I, I should emphasize that I don't know if the links are visible in the chat, but I put the links in the chat for the word generation curriculum and for the starry curriculum, which is for struggling readers who are three years behind. All of those materials, the entire curriculum are there and the starry offers also training for teachers on this combination of fluency and meaning making activities and have proven has proven to be uh, effective. In addition, we continue to work with teachers on this precise PALS construct. And so we're, we have worked with dual language uh, teachers and, and we have, for example, we produced with teachers sort of a map of six questions so that they could anticipate the, the challenges that kids might encounter in text instead of assuming that by fourth grade, the language is understandable, we need to be aware that kids might not understand the language of text. So even in the upper grades, those, you know, text discussions focused on particular fragments of text are actually very helpful uh, for kids. And so, you know, there are some strategies in which we would also, if, you know, if it's a history passage, and we would be reading a history passage, and this is also work that Mary Schleppengrill has done. You know, sometimes tracking participants, one of our domains is harder for kids. So we would work with uh, history uh, teachers to actually circle the participants in different colors and draw lines 
But that is always connected to a big question, you know, what is the big argument in this text? So that this sort of language tracking pieces will not be for the sake of language purely. They would be serving a larger uh, purpose. And so we are in the process of developing all these uh, additional resources that should be, you know, we're sharing and trying them with, with schools. We are also in the process of converting these core academic language skills, in this core analytical language skills instrument into a computer adaptive test. So we are partnering with schools, I mean, if schools are interested, they should contact me, but we're working with schools in administering this so that it will be converted to a shorter uh, instrument that is much more targeted to, to kids. It will be also for uh, English learners, and it will be a progress monitoring tool so that we can think about linking instruction and assessment, and that's the work that we are uh, conducting right now. And finally, perhaps I'll mention one more thing, which is a, an exciting project that my colleague Alejandra Meneses in Chile uh, is leading, and this is a science and language intervention for fourth graders. And so it's truly an exciting sort of hands-on science intervention, but with careful attention to language. And so kids are scaffolded to understand texts, or kids are, and kids are scaffolded to write explanations with support. And uh, the impact has been exciting. I mean, I visited those schools. It's a, it's a high vulnerable area with graders. And you see now girls in that classroom who want to be scientists and are mm -hmm. excited. And the, and the teacher is fascinating because she's been teaching for years. And she has become so excited about the fact that it's when she talks to her kids that she realizes what they understand and what they don't. And so it's originally a challenging process, but it, you know, with support and with curricula that are paying attention to both learning goals and language, that is a absolutely a doable as you were, you know, commenting on the San Antonio piece. I really am looking forward to getting a chance to see some of these materials and I, I also look forward to perhaps hearing you again with an update on all that you've been doing and where these projects stand. This has uh, been such a stimulating sharing of information. And I, I really wanted to thank you for helping us to think again about the gateways we're providing for our students to enable them to tackle these kinds of, of tasks and to build equity and to listen to our students as we work with them in their uh, learning of literacy. Um, I also wanted to mention to the audience that Dr. Uccelli is an IES grant recipient and that if you'll look in the resource section of the uh, conference, you'll see more about the grant process. And I wanted to thank all of you for being in our audience today and encourage you to join us in the plenary session that follows. Thank you all so much. Hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>